today we're going to cover uh, capital budgeting. Uh, and this is the first topic on capital budgeting. That means uh, capital budgeting technique. Uh, so far in finance, we have learned that, uh, first of all, what the objective of company. And uh, we learned uh, financial statement analysis. So you, learn, you know about balance sheet and income statement. And uh, how to compare different companies' uh, financial statements. After that, you learn the time value of money, the future value and present value, and so on. Then we cover the bond valuation and the stock valuation. So uh, what we have learned so far is basically uh, fundamentals before you get to learn really uh, corporate finance. So today's topic is the really first uh, real area in corporate finance. So uh, in corporate finance, we said the company's objective is uh, maximize the value of firm. Now if you take a look at the balance sheet, balance sheet, on the left hand side we'll see assets. And on the right hand side we'll see how these assets are financed. They are coming from so called borrowed money. So we're going to call that bonds. And the other part is owner's money. We're going to call that equity. So borrowed money and the owner's money of financing these assets. But for a company, for a business firm, there are many different assets to invest. How do we decide which asset to invest? That is capital budgeting problem. And in order to solve that issue, we have some techniques that allows us to evaluate different projects. And that's what this chapter is all about. And as the chapter uh, title indicates, net present value is a technique that we are going to utilize, but there are also other techniques to evaluate different capital budgeting projects. So given that background, so let's go right into uh, today's content. So we are going to learn some rudimentary methods such as payback and discounted payback methods. And we want to take a look at what are the shortcomings of that method. Then we're also going to learn some rudimentary accounting rates of return. And then we're going to talk about internal rate of return, which is kind of widely used in the real world. And also we're going to learn net present value. And lastly, we're going to take a look at so-called profitability index. Again, all these techniques are there to decide which project to invest. In other words, which project will maximize the value firm, which is the objective of the company. Okay, so keep in mind, the objective of capital budgeting is the maximizing the value of the company. With that goal, we are making a choice which projects to invest. So these are the outlines and we'll learn the first technique, net present value, is the most uh, sophisticated one. And uh, all good decision criteria for capital budgeting technique must satisfy these three conditions. That means when evaluating capital budgeting decision rules, the following criteria must be met. The first thing is, does a decision rule adjust for the time value of money? In other words, if a project will start and it will give you cash flow year one, year two, year three in the future, we must take, think that year three cash is, is, uh, has lower value than cash right now. In other words, time value money must be considered uh, in the uh, capital budgeting technique. Secondly, does a decision rule adjust for risk? We could have picked a project which is very risky well, we could pick a project which is not that risky. If a project is very risky, we must account for that. In other words, because of the riskiness of its project, we must discount with a higher required rate of return. So we must adjust the risk. So uh, is that considered in the capital budgeting technique? Thirdly, does a decision rule provide information on whether we are creating value for the firm. In other words, if we take a project, if it does not create any value for the stockholders, what good is it? Might as well not even do the project. 
So a project must create value to the stockholders. So these three criteria must be satisfied if a capital budgeting technique is a good one. So keep in mind that each capital budgeting method they're going to take a look at, we're always going to think about these three things. And if they are satisfied, that is a good capital budgeting technique. The first one is net present value. It's a difference between the market value of a project and its cost. So market value means present value or the future cash flow the project is going to generate. So how much value is created from undertaking an investment? So if the market value of a project is greater than its cost, then it must be creating value for the stockholders. Okay? So the first step is to estimate the expected future cash flow. So then, in other words, you have to come up with a pro forma income statement to predict what the future sale is going to be, and you have to be able to calculate cash flow. Secondly, you, know, you have to estimate the required return for project of this risk level. If it's a very risky project, obviously, the required return must be higher. Higher the risk, higher the required return. Lower the risk, lower the required return. So if you want to pick a very risky project, it must adjust it in terms of required return. And lastly, the third step is to find the present value of the cash flows and subtract the initial investment then you get the net present value. So for instance, the example would be, suppose you have calculated the following cash flow. Year one is when you make an investment. So you see the cash flow is negative, negative 165,000. That means cash is going out from the company. That's the cost of starting a new project. However, from year one to year three, there's possible cash flow. That means the project is generating positive cash flow for the firm. So what we are thinking is that, is a negative 165,000, is it worth for us to invest for the cash flow of 13, cash flow of 63,120 in year one, 7,800 in year two, 91,080 in year three. Those three years cash flow, are they big enough for a, to be compensated for the cash flow that we are going to spend right now, year zero. If the present value or future cash flow is greater than minus 165,000, then we could say that this project is a worthwhile project and we should invest. Okay? So, in this project, your required return for asset of this risk level is 12%. So, we're going to discount the future cash flow with a required return of 12%. Again, if the NPV, the difference between the present value of future cash flow and the initial cost is positive, then we are going to accept the project. A positive NPV means that the project is expected to add value to the firm and will therefore increase the wealth of owners. In other words, the stock price will go up. Since our goal is to increase owner's wealth, that's the objective of a firm, MPV is a direct measure of how well this project will meet our goal. Okay? And uh, in terms of uh, calculation, you discount it back, so you divide by 1 plus required return, and you square it in the second year, and cube it in the third year. But if you take a look at, use a table, uh, at the end of the book, the present value interest factor to be used. In either way, the net present value comes up to be 12,627. So NPV is positive, we are going to accept the project because it's generating positive value to the owner of the firm. So we go back to the decision criteria. Does the NPV rule account for the time value money because we took present value? The answer is yes. Secondly, does the MPV rule account for the risk of the cash flows? Yes, because we are just require return. Because high risk, we increase it. Low risk, we decrease it. So, we did account for that. Third one, does the MPV rule 
provide an indication about the increase in value? Yes, the size of that present value will tell us how much the firm value is going to increase. Lastly, should we decide, consider MPV rule for our primary decision rule? And the answer should be, of course, yes. So this is what the uh, net present value, and it's widely used in the real world. Now you could also use spreadsheet uh, using Excel in your uh, windows, and you can always calculate that. Uh, especially when the numbers are large, and if there are many different uh, uh, years and different projects, it's a lot, a lot easier to use uh, Excel uh, spreadsheet. Now, second uh, capital budgeting technique we're going to take a look at is payback period. What this means is that how long does it take to get the initial cost back in a nominal sense? In other words, how many years does it take for us to get back what we invested? So we get number of years. So as far as computation goes, first of all, you have to estimate the cash flows. Then you subtract the future cash flows from the initial cost until the initial investment has been recovered. In other words, how long it takes us to recover the initial cost. The decision rule is that we accept the project if the payback period is less than some preset limit. Uh, so the problem is that the preset limit is kind of arbitrary, uh, depending on the uh, firm. So there's no theoretical background what is the uh, right uh, preset limit should be. So using the same example as we were using before, uh, since the initial investment is 165000 by the first year, you recover the first year's cash flow, 63120 so you have not still yet to recover the difference, 108, 880. However, in the second year, your cash flow is going to be 7,800. So if you subtract that that amount what, from what's left that we haven't recovered, then we still have 31,080 to recover. In the third year, we're going to drive cash flow 91,080. So in the third year, we get enough money recover 31,080. So it has to be around year number three. So that's when we decide. So do we accept or reject the project? We know it takes us two years and some months to recover. More like it's a one-third of the year, so it's about two years and four months we are going to recover. Now again, it depends on the preset limit. Is two years and four months too long? Is it too short? I don't know. Depends on the company's preset limit. So in terms of criterion that we're going to compare to, does a payback rule account for the time value of money? Not really. We look at the first year's cash flow, second year cash flow, same thing. Uh, we didn't consider any time value of money. Does a payback rule account for the risk of the cash flow? Not really. Uh, but the sooner you recover, the better off it is. In that sense, uh, we might say that. But then again, like a pharmaceutical company, when you come up with a new uh, drugs, it takes a long time uh, to recover. Then according to payback period, it might be almost impossible to do that kind of project. Number three. Does the payback rule provide an indication about the increase in value? Not really. It, all it says is that how many years it takes us to recover the original investment. So, should we consider the payback rule for our primary decision rule? Answer is not really. However, this is still very popular. Many owners of a company, many owners of a small shops, they always wonder, when do I recover my initial investment? How long will it take? Uh, that's primary concern. They want to recover in two years, three years, or four years. So it's very simple. 
So in the real world, still many people are concerned about this issue. So the advantage of payback period is that it's easy to understand and adjust for uncertainty of later cash flow uh, and the bias towards liquidity, more liquid project. In other words, the projects will, which will generate more cash flow in the early years uh, that, that in a way more liquid project uh, will be in a way chosen. Um, and uh, in other words, uh, second fact, or just uncertainty of later cash flow, later cash flow we might not consider because in some cases when we get payback period even before that, and uh, in that way some pe people might say that we are adjusting for uncertainty. But there are a lot more disadvantages. First of all, we ignore the time value money. It requires some kind of arbitrary cutoff point and ignores cash flows beyond the cutoff date. All we consider is how long it takes us to recover, that's all, to break even. Also, it's biased against long-term projects, such as research and development and new projects. Something that you require high R&D, it's very difficult to initiate if you use payback period as a capital budget decision rule. So we modified it a bit from payback period. Instead of just using cash flow, we are using discounted cash flow to see how long it takes us to recover the initial investment. So first we compute the present value of each cash flow and then determine how long it takes to pay back on a discounted basis. We compare to a specified required period against uh, arbitrary. The decision rule is that accept the project if it pays back on a discounted basis within the specified time. Again, that's arbitrary current point. So, uh, example would be, assume we'll accept the project if it pays back on a discount basis in two years. So, two years is the limit. Then we calculate so-called uh, present value. The first year present value is 108, 643, second year. 52,000, third year, uh, and oh, sorry, uh, first year, uh, after you subtract out the uh, discount to the cash flow, you still haven't recovered 108. And second year, uh, you after, after taking the present value, subtracting out that amount, you still haven't recovered 52,000. In the third year, you recover enough. So, uh, it takes more than two years to recover the initial investment. So, but it says that in the first line, uh, the limit is two years. So in this case, do we accept or reject? We do reject it, right? Because it takes longer than two years. That's discounted payback period. So does the discount payback rule account for time value money? Answer is yes, we discount it, right? Does the discount payback rule account for the risk of cash flows? It could if we use a higher required return or just for the required return depending on the riskiness of the project. Does the discount payback rule provide indication about the increase in value? Not really because we do not consider any cash flow that comes after the cutoff period. So not really. Should we consider the discounted payback rule for our primary decision rule? Answer is no, because of we do not know how much the value is increasing. So advantages of using discounted payback periods are includes time value money, we discount the cash flow, easy to understand, and does not accept negative estimated MPV investments when all future cash flows are positive. In other words, if the net present value is negative, we will never accept that project even if we are using discounted payback period. Because we are this, assuming that we are discount cash flow with the same required return as the MPV. Okay? And lastly, bias towards liquidity, same as uh, just a simple payback period. The advantages are may reject positive MPV investment 
uh, if it does not meet the uh, limit, requires an arbitrary cutoff point, ignores cash flows beyond the cutoff point, bias against long term projects such as R&D and new projects, similar to a payback period, but it is a little bit advanced approach than simple payback period. The third approach is so-called average accounting return, which is coming from more of a field of accounting. There are many different definitions for average accounting return. The one used uh, in the book is uh, average net income over average book value. Uh, so in other words, uh, you have net income of year one, net income of year two, net income of year three. You just take a simple average. And the book value of the project. Obviously, the uh, book value of this project, uh, if you take a look at it, it was uh, 165000 165000 is the book value, initially, the cost of the project. But we subtract out the amount of depreciation, so the book value goes down each year by the amount of depreciation. So at the end of the project, the book value should be almost equal to zero. So you simply take the average of the book value of the project. Note that the uh, average book value depends on the, uh, how asset is depreciated. You could be using straight line depreciation, or you could be using accelerated depreciation method. Again, it depends on the uh, how assets uh, depreciate. Also, we need to have a target cutoff rate. What is the return we want in terms of average account return? The decision rule is that we accept the project if the AAR, average account return, is greater than some preset rate. So, assuming they require an average account return of 25%, so that is the cutoff point. If it's higher, we get from a project, we accept it. If it's lower, then we reject the project. So average net income, you add all three years net income, you divide that by three. Average net income is 15,340. And average book value is 72,000. So uh, by dividing 15,340 by 72,000, our Average account returns 21.3%. So our decision is, should we accept or reject? We should. It's lower than 25%, so we should reject the project. So we have a conflicting answers. According to payback period, we should accept it. But according to AAR, we should reject it. Again, these answers are due to we have some sort of arbitrary cutoff point. So does the AAR rule account for time value money? Answer is no. We didn't consider any time value money. Uh, does it account for the risk of the cash flow? Not really. And uh, does it provide any information about increase in value? Again, not really. So uh, we should not use average account return. Uh, for our decision criteria. Advantages of uh, using AAR are, first of all, easy to calculate. Just add net income, divide by number of years, and divide that by average book value. Another advantage is that needed information will usually be available. It's not difficult to get the information. However, there are several disadvantages. One, not a true rate of return, time value money is ignored, as we said before, and it uses arbitrary benchmark cutoff rate. Uh, 25%, I don't know where they got it. There's no sound theoretic background for that. And based on accounting, net income, and book value. In finance, we always emphasize cash flow. Net income is not cash flow, it's a part of cash flow. So you should be using cash flows and market value instead of using net income and book value. So in finance, we do not like AAR. 
Now, third, the uh, next one is a uh, little bit more sophisticated. Internal rate of return. Uh, we usually call it IRR, and this one is uh, widely used. Especially since uh, 1970s when getting an MBA degree became very, very popular. Uh, many people now are educated with financial management courses and they know the advantage of using IRR. This is the most important alternative to MPV. It is often used in practice and intuitively appealing. The reason is that in IRR, you get some sort of percentage. If I invest in a project, if I get like 13% return, what 23% return, it kind of makes sense. But if you say, some people say that you have an MPV of $10,000. What does $10,000 mean? Relative to what? It's absolute value. But percentage is relative term. So people have intuitively, it makes more sense. So people like internal rate return quite a bit more than MPV. It is based entirely on the estimated cash flows and is independent of interest rates found elsewhere. It's similar to what you have learned in terms of bond value valuation. We talked about when the bond value changes, you learned about yield to maturity. So yield to maturity in bond valuation was that you try to equate the price of bond with the future cash flow that you are going to derive from bond. And what's the rate that makes the present value of future cash flow equal to the price of bond? That was the yield to maturity. Internal rate of return is very similar. You equate the cost of the project to the present value of future cash flow. What interest rate will equate these two? That is internal rate of return. Very similar to yield to maturity uh, in bond valuation. So uh, definition is that IRR, internal rate of return, is the return that makes MPV equal to zero. In other words, cost of project is equal to the present value of all future cash flow of the project. The key is at what interest rate they are equal. That interest rate is IRR. Decision rule, accept the project if the IRR is greater than the required return. So if the required return is 12%, if IRR gives you 16%, we accept it. Because it's giving you more than the required return. However, if IRR gives you only 11%, when the required return is 12%, obviously you shouldn't accept it. So, how do we compute it? If you do not have a financial calculator, then it becomes a trial and error. You put different interest rate to make this two, two present value equal. But nowadays, uh, if you buy a business calculator from many different vendors, uh, used to be Texas Instrument used to be the only vendor, but now HP, Casio, all kinds of companies are coming up with a business calculator. And in the calculator, there's a function which calculates uh, MP, IRR. Also, you could always use a spreadsheet uh, to calculate the internal rate of return. Now, this is a MPV profile for the project. In other words, on the horizontal axis, we have different interest rate, or different required rate return, or different discount rates, similarly. Now, if the Discount rate is very low, like 2% all the way to the left. MPV becomes very high. And as you increase the discount rate, the MPV goes down. Now, internal rate return is at what discount rate? MPV is equal to zero. So as you can see from this graph, at 16%, around that number, MPV is equal to zero. Okay, so uh, as long as discount rate is less than 60%, you are going to get positive MPV, right? Positive MPV. But if the discount rate is greater than 16%, MPV is going to be negative. 
Again, internal rate return is the required return that makes MPV equal to zero. So, if we check it out the criteria, does the IRR rule account for time value money? And so is yes, we discount the cash flow with the required return. Does the IRR rule account for the risk of the cash flow? Yes, because we compare to the required return. Does the IRR rule provide an indication about the increase in value? Uh, it tells you in a way if the required return is lower than IRR, we accept it. So that's in a way uh, it shows. So we should consider IRR rule for our primary decision criteria. So we took two techniques, one MPV, another one IRR. Are they the same thing? Let's see. First of all, advantages of using IRR. Notice that there is no disadvantage. There is no left -hand side column on the right hand side. Knowing a return is intuitively appealing. Again, percentage return. Hey, if you invest in a project, what kind of return are you getting? I get 13%. I get 30%. It's you understand better than what kind of return you're getting. I get $30,000. It's uh, relative to what? How much are you investing? How are you getting $30,000? It's, it's just uh, kind of, uh, it doesn't come to you. It's not as intuitively appealing as IRR. It is a simple way to communicate the value of a project to someone who doesn't know all estimation details. Anyone who Anyone walking around the street, you say, uh, we have a project of giving you a return of 25%. They'll understand right away. It's easy. Thirdly, if the IRR is high enough, you may not need to estimate a required return, which is often a difficult risk. In other words, a uh, required return, the discount rate is not easy to estimate. Uh, but uh, after this uh, capital budgeting chapter is over, then we are going to talk about efficient market and so-called uh, so uh, risk-return relationship. And in there, we'll further talk about required returns, so, but we'll wait a uh, couple of weeks for that. So we can use, again, the uh, Excel spreadsheet to use uh, IRR. So summary of decisions uh, for the project is that uh, we are going to accept MPV as our primary, primary capital budgeting technique. And we are going to reject payback period, discount payback period, average accounting return. We are going to reject those three methods and we are going to accept IRR. Okay? Now which is better than present value or internal rate return? Uh, they give you the same decision, generally, but not always, that's the key. There are exceptions. When there are so-called non-conventional cash flows, cash flow sign change more than once. What it means is that, so far what we have seen is that year zero, right now, we have negative cash flow. Negative cash flow. That means we are making investment. Investment. And year one and on, we have positive cash flow. Means the cash flow sign change only once. We call that conventional cash flow. However, it's positive, but some years, you know, to continue with this project, we have to invest again. Let's say year one, two, three, we have negative 10,000. And year four, again, we have 5,000 then it is no longer conventional cash flow because cash flow sign changes more than once. Okay? In that case, we might have a conflicting answer between net present value and the internal rate return. So that's one case. Another case is that mutually exclusive project. We talked about mutually exclusive before, right? What's mutually ex exclusive mean? Uh, it means that if by taking one project, 
you must forego the other project. It's like this, in this building, we have a choice of making this building into an office building, or we can make this building as a department store. If we decide to make this building as a department store, we cannot make this building as an office building, right? So that means we have a mutually exclusive project. By taking one, we cannot take the other. So in that case, again, we might have a conflict answer. Initial investments are substantially different in that case. Also, time your cash flow is substantially different. Again, no matter what, we always say MPV is superior to tell you the conclusion. So internal rate return and non-conventional cash flows. When the cash flows change sign more than once, there is more than one internal rate return. When you solve for internal rate return, you are solving for the root of the equation. And when you cross xx more than once, there will be more than one return that solves the equation. It's awfully complicated. Well, basically, what it means is the following. Let's see uh, year 0, year 1, and year 2. You have minus uh, 10, you have plus 5, and you have plus, plus let's say, 7. Okay? Uh, and uh, we're going to call that 1 over r. 1 over 1 plus r is equal to x. Okay? 1 plus. Then, internal rate of return means that, means following. Those of you who are good with mathematics, you can see right away. So, minus 10 must be equal to 5 is year 1. So, you must discount by 1 plus r, right? Then 7 must be discounted by 1 plus r squared, right? Because second is cash flow. If I substitute x into 1 over r, then this one becomes minus 10 is equal to 5x plus 7x squared, right? So this from your high school days, we learned that 7x squared plus 5x plus 10 equals 0. This quadratic equation we can solve it, right? Now, however, if there's one negative sign like this one, it becomes a problem. Because solution to that is equal to, this is like a minus b plus minus, uh, if you remember high school, what is it? Here, if you remember from high school? 2a. 2a, the here 2a, right? 2a minus 2 plus minus. 4, A, what is it? A, C. Then, what do you do? Square root, right? Square root. <laughs> then, if you take a square this minus sign, and this minus sign is minus sign, the answer could be negative. How can a return could be negative? That's a problem of internal rate return. You understand? Because you could have two answers, right? Two. Because there's a plus minus sign, you, could, you are having two answers, right? So which one is real internal rate return? We don't know. That's what they are saying. That's what we mean by unconventional cash flow. So we have an investment, cost 90,000, and cash flow what? 132, 100, 150. Year, so in here, in year number three, we have negative cash flow. And the required return is 15%. What should be the internal rate return? Okay? So this is a scenario you're going to like look at. Now, if you draw this on a graph, we have this kind of uh, parabola. Parabola. And by solving it, we get two answers. It hits the horizontal axis twice. When the interest rate is 0.1, and when interest rate is between somewhere 0.4 and 0.45. So which one is a true internal rate return? That is the question. I don't know. I don't know. So that's the problem with internal rate return. When we are facing non-conventional cash flow, we should not be using internal rate return, but we should be using the present value. Okay? So summary decision rule is that the NPV is positive at a required return of 
so you should accept. If you use financial calculator, you would get IRR of 10.11%. But the required return is what? It says the required return of this project is 15%, right? And it says that if we use NPV, it's positive, so we're going to accept that. But if we calculate internal return, we only get 10%. Because that's what we saw before. 10%, right? It crosses x axis, 10%. So according to IRR, we should reject it, right? Reject it. So we get a conflicting answer. NPV says, take it. IRR says, reject it. In this case, we will always follow the decision of NPV. Okay? NPV. So you need to recognize that there are non-conventional cash flows and look at the NPV profile. When do we get non-conventional? All the time. We have a building, sometimes we have to renovate it, many projects. Sometimes there's a cash flow going in the middle of the project. Okay? So that, then we have non-conventional. And second case where IRR and it NPV might give you conflicting answer. The second case is mutually exclusive project. Uh, mutually exclusive projects, if you choose one, you cannot choose the other. Example would be, you can choose to attend graduate school at either Harvard or Stanford, but not both. But you can go to Harvard and get a PhD in Stanford. <laughs> uh, intuitively, uh, you would use the following decision rule. NPV, choose a project with a higher NPV. IRR, choose a project with a higher internal rate return. Right? So, we have two projects. Project A, project B. A, minus 500, B, minus 400. Year 1, 2, like that. Notice that project A, you get same cash flow year 1 and year 2. But project B, you get more cash flow in year 1, then year 2. Internal rate return, it seems that project B is better with a return of 22% compared to 19%. So according to internal rate return, we should choose B, right? But according to the present value, A gives you 64, B gives you only 60. So which project should we take? The required return for both projects is 10%. What do you think? Mutually exclusive. Both are good projects, right? If these are independent projects, we should be taking both of them. But we are, in a way, facing mutually exclusive projects. So we can only take one. Should we go by IRR or should we go by NPV? Answer is NPV, that's right. This is the NPV profile. See, depending on the cash flow, these NPV lines could cross, could cross. So you might get different answer. Below, let's say crossover point, below 11.8%, you could say A is better. Or the other way around, to the right hand side of cross point. So in this case, we have to use MPV. Okay? So that's why we are getting this one. Uh, and we always use MPV. However, you could use internal return. Only the exception is that non-conventional and mutually exclusive project. In those two cases, we should not use internal rate return. Um, because time is up for today's class, uh, I'm going to end here and I'm going to pick up what we left next time. Uh, and uh, we are going to learn this one and after this, we'll take a look at in terms of application of net present value uh, in, and how do we calculate cash flow in the net present value. So uh, today's class here, if you have any question, uh, please let me know. And otherwise, see you next week. Thank you very much.